And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Kylie Clark, also known as the Do-Over Man. Kylie believes that he has died and come back to relive the exact same life at least eight times, and today we're going to learn about it. Kylie, thank you so much for being my guest, and welcome. Hi, Jeff. Nice to be here. All right, Kylie. So I, I guess we should start from the beginning, and maybe you can tell us at least how you think you died the first time and go from there. Yeah, and I'm trying to process all this myself. I just recently got this download about a year ago. And uh, so it started out, I, I'm from rural South Texas. I grew up in a little bitty town. And in my home, it was me and my brother. I only had one sibling, an older brother. And my childhood home was kind of strange because, of course, I didn't understand at the time, but my father... He was an alcoholic and he slept a lot. He went to terrible depressions. Sometimes he would try to start businesses. Uh, he would get kind of excited about something for a while. And then eventually um, he would lose interest and then he would fall into the depressions for months. And that's when his drinking would increase. Uh, so I remember like getting up in the morning to walk to school and my dad would be asleep. And I would walk all the way to school and then come back around 3.30 or 4 and my dad would still be in bed. And so that was kind of confusing as a child. And he would he eventually get up and he would go to the liquor store and that kind of thing. Uh, and my mother also. So my mother, she was always panic stricken. And she had terrible anxiety disorder. Um, and she had terrible nightmares. So sometimes when I was a kid, I would lie in bed and I would hear my mom scream at night. And then I could hear her pacing back and forth. I could hear her ankles popping as she paced, wringing her hands in the night. And I don't know what she was dreaming of or why she had so many, you know, nightmares. But then also during the day, um, my mom was so easy to uh, go on overload, like any decision or anything that happened. She was like always right on the verge of, of, of panic or meltdown. Um, I, I used to say, which we never did this, but I always thought if someone would go behind my mom, sneak up behind my mom and go, boo, it would be like in the cartoons where the cat jumps up and claws the ceiling, you know? She was always just right there on the verge of panic. So that was really confusing as a kid, you know, dad drunk, you know, depressed, mom panic. Why is she so worried all the time? Uh, and it, it was just really confusing. So around seventh grade, you know, we, we would go bird hunting. You know, I, I, I deer hunted a few times. That wasn't really a big thing, but me and my brother sometimes would go bird hunting. He had a shotgun, I had a shotgun. And so that was just the kind of thing you did in the country. All the kids that I knew had their own guns. And in fact, I kept my gun in my closet with the shelves and everything, right? Um, so I don't know if it was, you know, just kind of being in this, this type of environment with my parents or really even why I did it. But one time in around seventh grade, I went into the closet and I got my gun out and I put a shell in the chamber and I cocked it and I put the gun in my mouth and I put my thumb on the trigger. And you know how the trigger has a little give before it goes off? I, I actually wiggled the trigger. And then I pulled the gun out of my mouth and my heart was beating. And I was like, like this adrenaline rush came through me. And then I took the shell out of the chamber, I put it up and I was like walking around just, you know, whoo, whoo, like that. So then, you know, a couple of days passed and I was messing around, I don't know if I, you know, Dad probably yelled at me or something. Went back to my room and shut the door. And I looked over and I saw my shotgun again. And I was like, went over there and got it, put a shell in the chamber, loaded it up, put it in my mouth, and sat there and wiggled the trigger. And same thing. I was just like, man, I took it out of my mouth. I was like, you know, just pumped, like I'd run a marathon or something. So I put the gun up and, you know, maybe a week went by and I walked by my brother's room and he was sitting in his, in his room listening to music. And I went into my room and shut the door and I immediately saw the shotgun. 
And so I opened the door, I went back in the hallway and I told my brother, I said, Hey, come here. I want to show you something. And you know how older brothers are. They're like, whatever, you know, like what? And I'm like, no, you're going to want to see this. And so he got up and he walked in my room and stepped, just stepped in the doorway. And I went and got my gun, I put a shell in the chamber, put it in my mouth. And I started wiggling the trigger. And I, I'll never forget seeing him out, out of my peripheral vision. He was frozen like a statue. And he was just mortified. And when I took it out of my mouth, I was like, Phew. he rushed over there and he grabbed the gun. He said, never do that again. He walked over there and he unloaded it in his room and he threw it up on top of the closet. And then he shut the door. You know, he just kicked me out. That's all he said is never do that again. He threw it up in his closet. And at that time, I probably would have need, needed a ladder or something to get up uh, to, to get it. But it really wasn't that important to me. You know, it was just like, oh, well, you know, I guess he doesn't want me to do that, you know. But what happened was a couple of nights later, I'm laying in bed, I cover up, and I'm just about to fall asleep, and I hear, bam, in my room, a gunshot. And I mean, it was loud, and I was immediately awake. But when I, was, when I woke up, I was out of my body. And I was traveling like, like just through blackness. I couldn't see stars or planets or suns or anything. It was just dark, but I knew I was traveling and I was like screaming, you know, I was terrified. I was like, ah, you know, what, what is going on? I, I start thinking I need to get back to my body. I need to get back to my body. Just horrified. And suddenly I was back in my body, but I was paralyzed. And I was laying there in bed and I couldn't move anything. And so I started thinking, if I can just wiggle my toe, if I can just wiggle my pinky, if I can just wiggle something, I'll be okay. And so I, I tried and I tried and I tried and eventually like I wiggled my finger and I came out of it. And when I did, I jumped up and I actually ran to the window and looked outside thinking somebody was outside with a gun. And then I ran into the hallway and I went into my brother's room and I, I looked around, he was asleep. I thought he was, maybe he was playing with a gun. It went off and there was somebody outside with a gun. I didn't know. I ran into my parents' room and they were asleep. And um, once again, like my heart was beating out of my chest and I just started pacing back and forth. And I was like, what the heck was that? You know, I didn't want to go to bed. I was afraid to go back to bed. But I eventually crawled in bed and I, I eventually like fell asleep like when the sun was coming up. And then, you know, like, uh, I, the next day, I, I was just kind of like confused. I, I wasn't sure you know, what had happened. But then after a couple of days, a couple of nights, you know, after a, you know, a few days, I kind of forgot about it. And so another night I was laying in bed, just about to drift off to sleep and bam, a gunshot went off again. And this gunshot, Jeff is not like, oh, in the distance I heard something or, you know, there was, you know, like a thunder. I mean, somebody was in my room with a gun and they, they, they shot it off right next to my ear. And again, I'm out of my body and I'm flying. And once again, I'm screaming, I'm terrified. Like, I, I don't, I, I'm just like, I got to get back to my body. I got to get back to my body. The same thing, I come back, I'm paralyzed. I don't know what to do. I finally wiggle my toe. I get up. I'm pacing. I mean, my heart, I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm, I'm freaking out. So um, I walk around the house, I even go look out the front door, walk out on the front porch. I'm looking around for somebody with a gun. I go back and I lay back down. Fast forward a couple of more nights, same exact thing happened. I hear the gunshot. But this time I have time to think, oh no, not again. And phew, I'm out of my body. And this time I'm not, I'm afraid, but I'm like, more like, really? Like this is happening again? Like really? This is kind of annoying now, you know? And so I feel like I get to the end of like this tether and then I'm just pulled back to my body. And when I, when I land back in, into my body, once again, I'm paralyzed. But this time I'm like, I'm just going to try to go back to sleep. Like, I'm just going to try to go back to sleep. And so um, 
And I lay there for a while, and of course my heart is beating and all that, but I eventually do fall back to sleep. And that was the last time that that's happened. But three times in a row, boom, boom, boom. So then, you know, fast forward years, uh, I mean, it's kind of like sometimes it came to my remembrance about that, but what, what more often came to my remembrance was the fact that me, as a little kid, used to put a gun in my mouth and how dumb that was. So sometimes as, you know, close, you know, my age now and throughout my life, I would be taking a shower or working or doing something. I would picture this kid putting a gun in his mouth, you know, and I would say, why? Like, why did I do that? That was, you know, almost having PTSD of what what might have happened, you know, that was so silly. And what if I didn't even die? Like, what if I would have just hurt myself real bad? You know, I mean, you know, just all of this, what if the gun would have went off? So fast forward about a year ago, I'm traveling with my cousin and me and my cousin and my brother, we kind of grew up together and my cousin is a psychic like an intuitive psychic and she's very i would say the veil is very thin for her and so she's she's done it professionally like she's talking to people's relatives that have passed over before uh she used to you know do all kind of things uh in the psychic realm um and, and so, and she's just very, very in touch with, um, with all that. So me and her was traveling, of course, even though she's a psychic and all that, she's my cousin. So we talk about our kids, we talk about, you know, our grandkids, we talk about life. And so I'm going down the road and we're traveling and I tell her, I said, I think I'm having PTSD about, you know, I told you that when I was a kid, I was putting like that gun in my mouth. And so sometimes like out of nowhere, it comes like, God, Jesus, what if that gun would have went off? Like, oh my God, you know, why did I do that? I'm so stupid, you know, what if? And Jeff, she told me something. She actually said two things, but I'm all, I'll, I'll tell you what she said. The first thing she said and tell you what the second thing that she said later. But when I said, what if the gun would have went off? She looked at me and she was like, oh, uh, you don't know? And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't know what. And she said, the, the gun did go off. Like the gun went off all three times. You killed yourself, you, you died all three times. And when she said that, Jeff, it was like, even though we were going down the road, it felt like my brain was going down the road 80 miles an hour and suddenly it got thrown into park. I mean, I literally felt like my brain like, wiggle and I got just this rush of memories and I couldn't even speak I mean she was just looking at me and I was just not only of those incidents but like a bunch of different incidents in my life that has taken place but I had dual memories now of like what really happened and then somehow it was rewound where it didn't happen so I could see it playing out both ways and I still have those two memories and with the, the gun incident, I flashed back to laying in bed when I heard the gunshot and I was out of my body. I was remembering the actual thing that happened before it was rewound. So when I was laying in bed, I would hear the gunshot out of my body, come back to my body. It was because that's what really happened the first time. Three times in a, well, let's, let's put it this way. I put the gun in my mouth, I pulled the trigger, it actually happened, things were rewound. A couple of days later, because I'm so intelligent, I went and got the gun again, <laughs> did it again, it actually happened, Ooh, it was rewound. And then a third time, let's go get my brother and let's let my brother watch this. And so I had a, a flood in the memories of the actual thing that took place. But once I experienced the memories of that, that was it. Like I experienced it. It actually happened. I, I felt what it was like leaving my body. I heard the gunshots that actually went off, so forth and so on. And so that I, and so when my, my cousin told me that, like, I, I really, I, I totally realized that for somehow, some way, like time 
time was changed or manipulated or something in some way during those three incidents, right? But I saw these other things. Like one time when I was probably a June, probably, probably the next year after that, after with the gun incident, the next year I'd gone out to a pastor party with some friends. People don't know what that is. The, you know, we country kids go out in the pasture, the cow pasture, and we pull up these trucks and we light a big fire and everybody's drinking beer and big high school party. And so I went out there and uh, I was hanging out with some guys my age. And one of them said, hey, let's steal my brother's truck. And so his brother went to school with my brother, which was five years older, four or five years older than us. And um, so me and this guy, we go get, we go check the truck, the keys are in it. We tell our other buddies, we jump in this truck. Uh, and I tell him, I said, wait, I'm going to get in the back. So I get in the back of this truck and we pull out on the dirt road. And I climb up on the cab of the truck and I turn around, there's like a road bar. And so I turn around backwards and I'm holding on to this rope bar like I'm riding a bull and I'm facing the back of the truck. And he starts flying down this dirt road, just going as fast as he can with a cab full of kids. This guy named Jerry was in the back and I'm standing on the top of this truck holding on to the rope bar. Next thing I know, the truck starts sliding, fish tailing like this. And I'm, fa I'm facing the road this way, and then it spins around. I'm facing the road the other way, and he's losing control of the truck. And suddenly it starts sliding sideways and skipping, and skipping and skipping and skipping. And eventually it comes to a stop. And everybody starts yelling, Yeehaw! Woo! All right. That was awesome. That was awesome. And the guy, Jerry, says, Man, I'm going to get in the front. And I thought, Okay. I'm going to get in the front too. So we both got out, we got into the front and we took off while well, he decides to do, you know, he steps on the gas again. And the next thing I know, we get about half a mile down the road and we're doing like 80 and, and the same thing starts happening. The, the truck starts, you know, losing control and then it slides sideways. It hits a ditch and it starts flipping over the fence into a cornfield. The driver gets thrown out. Uh, the rest of us have bumps and bruises and stuff like that, but nobody was badly injured. So when my cousin told me that, I, I relived that moment in my mind, but when I was on top of that cab riding the, this, this bull, it flipped. It flipped the first time, and I was killed. But in some weird way, it, it, it went back. I got jerry said let's get in the front or he said i'm going to get in the front and we both got in the front and we were safe when it rolled the next time when it actually rolled and we were okay you know um but now i have dual memories of that incident and there you know like there there's several other ones like one time i was on, on top of a barn and i was messing around with some guys i climbed up on top of this 20-foot barn and my foot fell through I went down to my knees and my momentum took me off the side of the barn and I was going head first into the ground like a lawn dart. I mean, I was just going straight down into the hard ground head first and suddenly something spun me around. I landed on my feet, on my butt and then on my back and all my buddies started laughing and I, 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 I kind of started laughing myself and I looked up at my sleeve and my sleeve was ripped. And what had happened was I fell head face down, but somehow my arms went back behind my, on my side and it got caught on a nail. My sleeve got caught on a nail and it spun me up where I would be feet first, landing feet first instead of head first. And so I used to tell that story all the time. And even the, the two guys that were there, I said, like, hey, remember when I fell off that barn? And they were like, yeah, man, that was funny. Well, now I remember that I died. I fell and I broke my neck. But in some weird way, this in this other memory, a nail, some nail just happens to catch my sleeve and spin me around. Well, those are some amazing stories. <laughs> and different ideas pop into my mind while you're telling them. And 
you know, when you first get out of your body, it's pretty common for people to hear a pop when they get out of their body. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe he just got out of her body, but not a gunshot boom to get out of their body. So, hmm, well, maybe that's not it. And then I start thinking, is it possible that he had lived this same life in another dimension and in that dimension, he actually died. And somehow you're tapping into the memories of another dimension because as strange as it may sound, I, I'm pretty sure one guest told me that, you know, we have our higher self in another realm and we could even be living two separate lives here on earth throughout our, our higher self. So why couldn't we be even living in another dimension simultaneously? Yeah, the thing about that pop though, it was a gunshot. It was my yeah. shotgun. Like I had shot that I had shot birds with it many times. And so I, I know the sound of that gun going off. It was a 410. And that was the exact sound that I heard before I left my body. I'm trying to piece together the time point of you having the OBE and rewinding. Yeah. How do you put that together? I don't. I don't know. But let me let me tell you a couple more incidents because this this was like this flash of memories that came to me, mm -hmm. and 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 maybe they have some insights into them as well. I don't know. Like I say, I'm still processing this myself. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I was in high school, went went on a date. Me and uh, me and a friend of mine, we we took these girls out on a date. Long story short. We're driving them home. We come off an access road onto the highway and we run right into another vehicle and our truck starts flipping. And I don't remember anything except for waking up the next afternoon. I'm in the hospital and I'm in traction. I broke my pelvic bone in, in two places. I had a big chunk uh, of meat that was taken out of my back because of the windshield. And a police officer walks into my hospital room and he goes, and he, this guy was actually a friend of my brother's. And he said, uh, here, I found these, I, I found these stuck in the dashboard. I thought you might want them. And he threw my teeth onto my chest. Wow. And he said they were stuck in the dashboard. And so I was thrown from the back seat into the front seat, broke my pelvic bone big chunk of meat out of my back busted out all my teeth and once again that was just another story until boom now it feels like another time i died fast forward to when i was married um, to my first wife i was suffering from all kind of anxiety depression mental health issues i i turned to the same coping mechanism that my dad used which was alcohol gotten a huge a fight with my wife and I, and I decided the best thing for me to do is to go out to West Texas, move out to West Texas and work in the oil fields and just send my family money. So I was already drinking. I got in my truck. I picked up some more beer. I start driving. It's already getting dark. I'm drinking the whole way. And then I start, I'm starting to black out and I'm way out past Bernie, way past out in the middle of the desert driving to West Texas, I was trying to go to Odessa and there wasn't nothing out there. And, and my memory is I see a hitchhiker, but then I black out. I kind of wake up and the hitchhiker is in the seat next to me, in the passenger seat. And I remember him saying, you're scaring me. As in my driving was scaring him. There was beer cans all over the, the empty beer cans all over the, the truck. So then I pass out again and I wake up and I look over and he's driving my truck. Mm. So then I black out again, Jeff, and I wake up and I'm in a, in a roadside diner, like in a truck stop diner. And there's a, there's a full cup of coffee in front of me. On the other side of the table is a full cup of coffee, but nobody there. So I get up and I'm starting to walk towards the cash register, like reaching into my pocket to pay. And the waitress says, that's okay, that's okay. He already paid for your coffee. So I stumble out, still drunk, into the uh, parking lot. I'm thinking, he stole my truck. He stole my truck. I look around, and there's my truck. So I stagger over there. I open the door. I get in, and I'm looking for the keys. And I'm, I'm like, I can't find the keys. I look up on the visor, and I pull the visor down, and the keys drop in my lap. 
So I started up, I started going down the access road to get back on the highway and my truck is doing this. And there's something wrong with it. So I, I I'll go to the access road and I finally get onto the highway and I'm just drunk and I'm on, on the shoulder of the road. And like, I, I, I had to stop because the truck was acting weird. I put it in park and I walked around to the front and the two front tires were flat. He had let the air out of my tires. This guy had let the air out of my tires so I wouldn't drive. And as soon as I got out and noticed that, I saw flashing lights and, and a highway patrol pulled up and he said, everything all right? And I said, yeah, I got two flat tires. And he didn't, he said, turn around. He, he, he handcuffed me. He threw me, he called, he called a tow truck, took me to jail. So there's two things that's interesting about that. Well, uh, let me tell you this one part. So when he took me to jail, uh, he opened the door and he let me into this, these cells. There, there was like eight bunk beds and all of them were full. And so I got a blanket and I just laid on the floor in this cell with like eight other guys. And sometime in the middle of that night, I fell asleep and then I woke up like 30 minutes later, an hour later. And Jeff, when I woke up, it was like, I was as sober as I've ever been. And I had clarity, perfect clarity regarding how I had mistreated people, how I had lied to people, how I hadn't been good to my children, how I hadn't been good to my wife. Uh, how other people viewed me and I, I felt like their feelings towards me and even their subconscious feelings like even though they didn't know that I was hurting them or disrespecting them somewhat somewhere deep down they knew that that they shouldn't be treated like that but because of my alcoholism and my mental health issue, issues and things like that and lack of understanding and ignorance I was treating people because I was suffering so I was treating people badly but in that jail cell, I had perfectly perfect clarity of that. And I started screaming, Jeff. I started screaming because there was no buffer. There was no alcohol. There was no drug. There was no buffer between me and these feelings and other people's feelings. And so I started screaming. And I'll never forget the, 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 the guards came in there and they flipped me over and they hogtied me. They handcuffed my, my arms, they handcuffed my legs, they handcuffed my arms and my legs together. They picked me up like a duffel bag. They took me to this isolation cell. They opened it up and they threw me in there and they shut it. And I'll never forget the, the when they threw me in there, they said, you act like an animal, we're going to treat you like an animal. So I screamed until I couldn't scream anymore. And I, I finally fell asleep. And then the next morning when they unlocked the cell, they said, are you finished? And I said, yes, I'm finished. So they, they, uh, they took the cuffs off of my legs. They stood me up, they un, un, unhandcuffed my wrists. They walked me back to that original cell and they handed me a plate with breakfast and coffee. And then they let me back into that original cell. And I saw all those eight guys sitting there on like uh, chrome tables. And there was only one, one empty spot. So I sat down at that empty spot and I started eating my eggs. And the guy across from me said, are you just getting in? And I said, yeah, yeah, man, I'm just getting in. He said, well, you're lucky you weren't here last night because some crazy guy was screaming all night long. And so that was like the, that was like one of my bodies, that clarity of feeling other people's feelings it never went away. So it, it basically ruined my drinking, even though it took me several more years to get sober, that I could never be that person that didn't know anymore. And so from that feeling and from those memories, I, I see myself driving to West Texas and they're not being a hitchhiker. I see myself passing out, running off the road and dying. Then I see it replayed where there was a hitchhiker that drove me to go get coffee and let the air out of my tires. And then a cop immediately arrested me when I got back on the road. And then having an awakening experience that would later lead to my sobriety. Hmm. So yeah, it is, this is all very baffling for me too, Jeff. 
when you were going out of your body and you were flying really quick, quickly, what did you see out there? Was it like flying through the universe or space or what? All I remember is blackness, but I knew that I was traveling at a high rate of speed. Like there's no way that we can't travel at this speed. And I, I don't remember seeing anything just like velocity. I could feel the momentum and I was myself because I was screaming. I was like, ah, you know, I got to get back to my body. I knew I was outside my body and I didn't know how I'd get back there. You know, how do you assess what happened to you? So I can also tell you another interesting thing, right? So I, I talked about my family, right? So everybody thinks they're kind of the black sheep of the family. Um, with my, my dad and my mom always kind of looked at me and treated me different than my brother. So, so there was some, there's some, there was some, something there where my mom never had a, had a conversation with me longer than, are you hungry? Do you want a sandwich? Are you thirsty? Did you do your homework? But she would sit in there and talk to my brother for forever. You know, uh, when, when I came into the room, me and my mom were in the same room. It was like a tuning fork, like. Her anxiety would, would, would stir up my anxiety, and then our anxiety would start working together, and I would have to get out of it. That's how my whole life with her was. Like, she would talk and carry on and talk to my brother and have all these great conversations. When I'd walk in, our anxiety would start working, and, and one of us would have to flee. And the same thing with my dad. Like, my dad, my dad used to also tell me this story, so he was the only one that would tell me this story. So him and my mom got divorced and he kept drinking. He actually died, you know, from his drinking and I'd go visit him and we would sit there and I could tell that he was about to tell this story because his eyes would kind of glaze over and he would look at me like I was a ghost. And he would say, you, 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 you almost died. You, you almost died. And then I knew he was going to say, he would tell me that when I was just learning to crawl, they were sitting in the living room and they looked around and said, where's the baby? They got up and went down the hallway and went into the bathroom and I had pulled out this poison from behind the toilet and it was some kind of fragrant oil that it was like in a metal canister and I was drinking it. Mm, wow. And so they grabbed me, they rushed me to the hospital and my dad would, would say, you were in an oxygen tent for three weeks. Like every day after work, I would go stay at the hospital. I'd spend the night at the hospital with you. And you were just a little baby and you drank poison. And every night I would spend the night there with you. And so my connection to that story was just, I would think, what is an oxygen tent? You know, I, I would see a little kid camping out in the hospital with a little cook stove and a little campfire in a tent, you know, but in reality, it was a very, very severe situation where they had to pump oxygen in there and I was very ill. And, but my dad would say, you almost didn't make it. You almost didn't make it. And so, you know, once again, like thinking after me and my cousin had that conversation, once again, like I have this, this, this like memory, there's a blue baby that's getting like heart compressions. And, and my dad who, who's ex-military, is blowing into the baby's mouth and doing heart compressions. And this baby is completely blue and it doesn't make it. But then that memory kind of fades. And I, and then I just remember my dad telling me that story. Like I, I have no conscious memory of drinking that poison as a baby, just what my dad said, you know? But I was going to tell you that my cousin, she actually told me something. She told me two things. So when I said about the gun incident, I said, I'm so lucky that that gun didn't go off. And she said, oh, don't you know it did? Like you killed yourself, you died three times. And then she said something that may seem shocking, um, but I think she was just finishing her, her thought. She said, why do you think your dad drank so much? Why do you think your mom was so full of anxiety? And I you know, in this rush of like thoughts, 
you know, you ask me like, what, how, what do I think about all of this? It's like, you hear everything that could possibly happen is happening now. Like there is no future, there's no past, the, only the present moment and everything. We invented time, everything, all of this stuff, all of these deaths that were rewound in some weird lifetime, some par parallel universe, my dad had to go through not watching a baby. And my mom too, the baby went in there and drank poison. Oh my God, how, ter how, how terrible. And the, and the baby didn't live. And then you know, on some other timeline, they lived through this kid in junior high that died, you know, playing around with a gun. And then this other lifetime, there's these car accidents and all this stuff. And so in their, in all of our psyche, even my brothers, you know, in some lifetime, my brother witnessed his own brother playing around with the gun and it didn't turn out well. And my brother, he, 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 he had an unhealthy relationship to food and obesity and he had his own struggles in his life before he passed. But our whole family seemed to be traumatized by something that is not in this realm, not in this lifetime. Nothing really happened that bad to us in this lifetime. But yet we were all touched by it. My father, my mother, my brother, and myself. My own sadness, my own depression, my own struggles with mental health and alcoholism. It seems to be coming from some PTSD that I don't remember. Have you ever considered getting hypnotized? Yeah, I've never, you know, tried to find somebody, but I would definitely do it if it was offered. I would love to find somebody that is that does that type of thing, and I would definitely do it. Another weird thing for me is like spirituality, ever since I found sobriety in 2006, I've read every book on spirituality. You see the Buddha behind me, you know, I, I even had an opportunity to go to India and I was there for almost a month and I saw the Dalai Lama and I got to study in a Tibetan monastery and I've, I've studied all the major religions. I've studied, uh, you know, spirituality. And it's just this deep fascination to all things metaphysical. But I have never saw an angel or I would love to see a UFO or even mm. Bigfoot or, you know, hear the voice of God. It, it, it's nothing like that supernatural has ever happened to me except for this. Mm -hmm. This thing is, it, it must be somewhere in the background that's constantly, that's all I ever read about is spirituality. That's all I ever think about is like God and, 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 and you know, afterlife and, 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 and all these spiritual things. Um, but yet, you know, I, I haven't had like a true, and you know, I didn't die on an operating table and, and, yeah. and have these memories of physically seeing loved ones or an angel or something like that. But there are, there's definitely something that propels me to uh, seek out uh, whatever the truth is or whatever the reality is. Can you recall any instances of missing time in your life? Not really. No, no. It seems like your life is a really big puzzle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I've been able to do, and so, you know, whatever, you know, like maybe, maybe this had to be because I play some small part in something that's unfolding that's really not super important. You know, sometimes even like in the Bible, I've noticed that people are, you know, they're mentioned in the Bible, but really it's just because they're the great, great grandfather of somebody that does something really important down the line, you know? So there, there must be, there might be some reason why I had to stay alive. You know, I have three children myself. I have three stepsons, all six kids I love with all my heart. I have a grandchild. You know, I, I'm divorced and I'm married a second time to the love of my life. I said I went to India. I made this really strong connection to a Tibetan Lama. And, uh, you know, when I got back from India, I started writing these books. Like these books just kind of started coming through me. I, I've written like seven books. Yeah. And I don't even understand them either. Like two times this guy walks in. He goes, hey, I'm going to read something to you. That's what that works. And he starts reading something, some really beautiful poetry that was like, oh, wow, that's breathtaking. And I said, wow, 
like, what, what is that from? He said, no, I think you wrote it. It's from one of your books. And I said, oh, wow. You know, and another time I was at a yoga studio and after we did our yoga, we laid in corpse pose and we were cooling down and the instructor liked to read something to us while we were like cooling down. And she started reading out of this book and it was like music. Like it was kind of like, it's, it sounded kind of like I was hearing music, but I knew it was words. And, I, and the only thing I could think of was, man, I need to ask her what book that's from. I can't wait to buy it. And so she said, all right, class, you know, that's it. You can get up, you know. So I got up and rolled up my mat. And I started walking towards her to ask her and I could see she was holding one of my books in her arm. And I suddenly made the connection. She was reading out of one of my books. And so I whipped around and just left. So I don't even know if she knew that I was in that class. She probably didn't. I don't know why, where she got my book, but I totally didn't recognize it. And I, and I have this, hmm. this connection to all of these books. It's like periodically I'll open them up and I can't remember writing. Like, oh, that's it. amazing. I remember now I had forgotten when I was researching you that you did have a whole uh, on Amazon, you had a whole ton of books and mm -hmm. is it possible that you're doing that through automatic writing? So I don't think it's automatic writing because it seems like a little bit more difficult than that. And I am conscious and there's a lot of editing involved, but, but it's coming from a higher source or it's coming from my higher self or it's coming through me. But there is some work in, involved in like choosing the right word, rewriting it, editing it a few times to make sure that it's perfect. So there, there's an art to it, but yet I know that I'm not capable of creating those things. You know, uh, I don't come from a background. I don't have the type of education. I don't have the knowledge of literature and all those skills that it would take to write these things. And plus, you know, some of them are about Buddhism, but I mean, it is beyond my comprehension. You know, it's above my pay grade to, to write about Buddhism at this level. And then there's some other ones that come out like uh, post-apocalyptic poetry. Like it's almost like looking into the future and like seeing the world after like a nuclear bomb. Or maybe I'm seeing some other timeline or something but it's both physical, everything is both spiritual and physical in this realm. So it, it's, it's confusing where I would even come up with that. But uh, yeah. What's interesting is you don't remember your own books. What I'm understanding, I mean, you heard somebody quote your book and you didn't even know that was yours. Yeah, I just think it comes from a higher place, but I'm also like, a, a, I'm a channel for it, but it also takes some, some, some work. To, to make sure that I'm hearing it correctly and getting it down, you know, so, uh, but once it passes through me and it's on the written page, I almost, it's like, I forget it. Hmm. It's like once it's in a book and it's published and it's out there, I, I it's, it's not mine anymore. It was like, I did it for somebody else. I, I did what they asked me to do and now it doesn't belong to me. Well, if people want to reach out to you and chat with you or give you their opinion or talk to you or whatever are you open to that and if so how should they contact you probably through email so it's my it's my, it's my first name middle name and last name so it's kylie k-i-l-e-y john j-o-n clark c-l-a-r-k at gmail .com. okay i think how i found you was on amazon i just put in kylie clark and it seemed like like 20 books came up or something is that about yeah, right i also created a website that's an online bookstore for the what, books what is the website so the website is futurebuddhabooks.com okay futurebuddhabooks.com that'd probably be the quickest easiest way to get to them all right kylie well before we finish up can you leave us with one last positive message Part of the reason why I wanted to come and, and talk about this, like I said, I'm still processing it, but I truly believe that 99% of our life is the story we're telling ourselves about our life. Like, it doesn't matter what you are saying about my life. It doesn't matter what anybody is saying about my life. What is important to me and what is impactful to me is the story that I'm telling myself. And I, I work in mental health myself, 
and I see people every day uh, that have, have experienced true traumas, right? They've experienced terrible things in their life, and yet um, they're not able to change that story. And they're telling themselves a story of somebody that has been hurt and abused and that life is bad and that um, the world is a terrible place. And I've met people and I meet people every day that have had similar traumas, similar childhood, similar backgrounds, but some way they've been able to change their story. And they're telling themselves a survivor story. They're telling their, their self a story of an overcomer. They're telling themselves of somebody that experienced something and learned from it and they're better for it and they're going out and they're helping others. So my, my life has always been about choosing the story I'm telling myself so that I can choose the world uh, or the reality that I live in and tell myself an upbeat story, uh, a story of success and a story of an overcomer. And I will say this too, and this might sound weird with the guy with the Buddha behind me, but on all these different paths that I've taken in my life, I keep running up against this God, um, this mysterious God that is like a God of second chances, a God of do-overs. And I can't explain it. And I, I can't say, you know, this God is uh, inside of us, internal and external. Um this God is all love and no judgment. This God is perfect love. And this God uh, is definitely about second chances and do-overs. And I don't know how to explain that, but that's, that's been my experience over and over and over. Kylie, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest today. I really appreciate you and I wish you the best. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.